God bless you. Thank you so much. I love it, don't you? The Lord is so good to us. I love my dear brother. Thank God for him. And uh, I'm glad that when he was a young man, he gave his life to God and then surrendered to do something for God. He did what every Christian should do, and that is he told his family and his friends about Jesus. You just don't get any better than that, do you? I love this place, and I'm so grateful to have a part in this meeting. And uh, I'm really praying that God will help me, that the Lord will just help me to say something and to give you something that will result in people hearing the gospel. It's hard for me to believe the world is in the condition it's in. It's really hard. I uh, get to travel. I've had opportunity to be in many places in the world. God has opened many doors of service and preached the gospel in places I never dreamed I would ever go and see. I've been in some of the poorest villages and some of the richest cities. And I'll tell you, there's not a greater place in all the world that needs the gospel than our home, this country. And uh, I'm so burdened and concerned about what's taking place in America. And I just want to try to share with you some of those things tonight and pray that God will meet with us. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn, if you would please, to Acts chapter number one, and we'll read just a portion of scripture in Acts chapter number one. I appreciate Brother Ab Thomas. He poured his life in people, and he's still doing it. And he poured his life in my life and my children. Both of my girls had the opportunity to grow up at Highland Park Baptist Church and be a part of the master's program, the master's club, and also in the teen program. He took them to Mexico on a mission trip, and uh, they still talk about that to this day. It was life-changing. And I certainly appreciate him and his dear sweet wife, Ms. Thomas. God love her. She was my English teacher. I don't think she would claim to say she was today, but no, I'm just kidding. I remember my first day and we had a, a pop quiz, a test, just to see what we knew. And I didn't do so very well. And she said, now Tommy, don't get discouraged. Most people who have been out of school as long as you have, have to repeat this class. I thought, wow. <laughs> but the good news is, she let us grade her own tests, so I passed. <laughs> I always kid with her about that. I'm just cutting up. But she really stirred my heart up. She told me, I never will forget, I was having difficulty putting all these things together. And she said, uh, will you tell good stories? And I'm gonna teach you how to write your stories. And I've been writing stories ever since. And thank the Lord for it. But let's look at Acts chapter number one, verse number eight. The Bible says, but ye, that's a powerful statement but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's pray. Father, dear Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. And Lord God, you know my heart. And there's so much I want to say to help me say the things that's pleasing to thee. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you've given us this opportunity, this moment, to make a difference in this world, and especially our Jerusalem. And dear Lord, as you looked that day, cried, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
May you open our minds and hearts of understanding tonight about our Jerusalem. Help us tonight to determine that we're truly going to make a difference, not only in Judea and Samaria and the innermost parts of the world, but help us tonight to determine we're going to make a difference in our Jerusalem. We'll thank and praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. I want to read you something I wrote about our Jerusalem. And uh, God really has stirred my heart about reaching our Jerusalem. I live in Fort Myers, Florida area, southwest Florida. Uh, When I went there, my wife and I, we started Gulf Coast Baptist Church back in 1989. Boy, that seems like such a long time ago. They told me that our city was for newlyweds and nearly deads. And I thought, well, that's going to be something. I hope there's someone in between newlyweds and nearly deads. But our city has exploded like other cities in Florida. Our county has exploded. We now have over 750,000 people in our county. And in the winter, we'll have 200,000 guests come in the month of March and April. And we literally have people from around the world. And so I wrote this thing with that in mind. The world has come to our Jerusalem in search of the God of Abraham's blessing. The circumstances that has driven these people to our land for refuge and hope is part of God's unfolding plan for the ages. We who know the Lord and have a measure of understanding of how God, our co-labor, works, believe this migration of people groups is taking place in order for them to have a divine encounter with the gospel. We have living in the shadows of our churches people who a few short years ago were thousands of miles and years of missionary planning away. But now they are living in our Jerusalem. They have come from around the world, enrolled their children in our public schools and are now part of this great nation. In our public schools, We have children from most of the countries of the world. For example, in the Lee County School System in Fort Myers, Florida, we have children from 149 different countries speaking 156 different languages. That's according to the Lee County 2017 Impact Report. They also reported that 37,000 of these children live in homes where English is not the primary language spoken in the home. In our public schools, 37,000 children live in homes where English is not spoken. Now, don't think that these are homes where Spanish is spoken. The largest group of people in our county are people from Germany. And we have people from all over Europe and all over Asia. We have many Russians. We have people from all over the world. Their children are in our schools. We know God's will has not changed. He is not willing that any should perish, including these precious people. We also know that our mission has not changed. We are to publish a gospel among all nations. But what has changed is how we can reach all nations. We now have these families from other nations living in our country and we can reach them with our Jerusalem ministry. Our home has now become the foreign field. I went this year to some high school football games and um, we have many young people in our church they who attend public school. And I went to the football games. And I went early 
and just watched it. I went to Fort Myers High School and Cape High and a couple other high school games. I was sitting at Fort Myers High School game and Fort Myers High School I think has 2,400, 2,500 students in high school. We have 13 high schools in our county. And I was watching this whole thing unfold. And I was sitting there, I came early. As I drove to the property, I was met by teenagers showing me where to park. I parked, I got out of the car, they welcomed me. I walked past others, they said hi, and I'm glad I came to the game. I went to the gate, I had a pass to get in, they showed it, they greeted me. I walked past the concession stands, and they were all there cooking and preparing food, and I was early. And then I went and took my place on the home team's bleachers, and I was one of the first people in the bleachers, and I was just watching because I wanted to see, I wanted to see this whole thing. I watched the young people come out with the football equipment and all the young people taking care of things, and then I watched the band and all of those, and they came and they found their places in the bleachers, and there would be people showing them where, and the whole stadium began to fill up and thousands of people ended up in that stadium. And I realized that night that everything I had witnessed was done by young people, a few adults. They pulled the whole thing off. And as I was sitting there watching it, I thought, why can't we reach these precious people? Why can't we reach these young people? with the gospel and let them do for God what they do for a sports program. Why can't we do that? We have living in our time, six living generations. We have the great generation, that's those who fought World War II and they're dying. Most of those are homebound or in nursing homes or assisted living. Then we have the silent generation. That's the ones who are a little too young to go to World War II. And they're the ones who fought the Korean War. And they're now approaching 80. I guess some are actually 80 years old now. And most of them are pretty much out of the business part of it. And many of those also are in assisted living and nursing facilities. Thousands upon thousands of them. And then we have the baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer and it's hard to imagine that here we are baby boomers and there's not much baby left in us. And then we have the Generation X. That's the fourth generation. And the Generation X are the ones who are pretty much running things now. They're in charge of the churches and all. And then we have the Millenniums. Thank God for the millenniums. <laughs> and then we have what they call the Generation Z, the Z-Gens, which are the young people in our public schools. There's 54 million of them enrolled in our school system. And most churches are only working with two generations. Some are working with the third, trying to reach the third, and but we ought to make sure that our ministries are reaching every generation. Can you imagine if we can reach these young people who are in our school systems and teach them how to win others that they can reach five other generations that's alive now. They can reach the great generation, the silent generation, the generation X, the, the millenniums. They can reach five other generations and if the Lord doesn't come and they live for a long time. They can reach five more generations. They can actually reach 11 generations of people. Now that's a lot of potential. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to determine that our Jerusalem is part of what God wants us to do. And I'm so concerned and so burdened about the fact that our churches have changed so much and especially in the last few years, things are changing so quickly. There's 
A portion of scripture I'd like for you to see, it's in the, the gospel according to Luke chapter number 17. And the Lord Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, he said unto them in verse 22, the day will come when you shall desire to see one of the days. By the way, we talk about those golden days that we had. It's hard for me to believe that the great days of Highland Park Baptist Church and the great days of the churches and things that I had a part in, that those days are gone. Brother Ab and I were talking at the motel. We were going over some things, how God had blessed us and let our lives cross each other's paths and just how the Lord worked and talked about the youth ministry and the children's days and the great days at Highland Park Baptist Church. And it's an amazing thing to see thousands and thousands of people coming together and then to see thousands of people reached with the gospel and the work of Jerusalem in that great church. What a powerful ministry it was. And we were talking about it and as we were talking about it, I was thinking about this text because I'd read it before and I thought, you know, the day will come when you desire to have one of those days and oh my, what I wouldn't give to live one of those glorious days again. But I can live them. I rehearse them in my mind quite often and think about them. But the Lord Jesus said, you would like to see one of the days with the Son of Man and you shall not see it because those days are gone. Now it's this day. It's our day. This is your day. This is your hour. He goes on to talk about as in the days of Noah. And we know that one day this world is gonna be like it was in the day of Noah, especially after the rapture toward the end of the tribulation when the thought of man's heart is continual evil. This world is fast racing toward the judgment of God. And then the Lord Jesus says in verse number 28, and I want you to notice that, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. They said they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. In the days of Lot. Now, most of us would agree tonight that this world is fast becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. Would you agree with that? I remember years ago, I heard Brother Lester Roloff preach a sermon uh, he preached it on the radio and it was entitled The End Time Sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was unbelievable what he said. Matter of fact, my wife and I were listening to it on the way to Florida on one of our vacations and Brother Riley had asked me to speak and, and she said, please tell me you're not gonna preach this sermon. <laughs> and I said, honey, I don't think people could handle it. That's a tough sermon. He preached The End Time Sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that was back, back in the early 80s. It was powerful. But can you imagine what those men of God would think about the day in which we live? But I want you to notice that the Lord Jesus is not just talking about the end time sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said in our portion of scripture, as it was in the days of Lot. You see, we fail to see the other side of the coin. We fail to see what's actually happened. It's not that the world is becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's Christians are becoming like Lot. And that's the sobering thing. As a matter of fact, I believe we're living in a, with, in a day of Gomorrah-minded people in the world with Lot-minded Christians. Now think about Lot. You can make some note because of time we won't turn to the portion of scripture. But Lot, it's hard for us to imagine that he was actually what we would call a saved man. The Bible says that righteous man vexed his righteous soul. If we stood Lot on the platform tonight and there he was and you could see how he lived and what he looked like at the end of the days of of Sodom and Gomorrah and we stood Judas 
on the platform and you could see what he looked like when he was a disciple. Most of us, not knowing anything about him, would say that we want our children to be like Judas and certainly not like Lot. But the truth of the matter is, Judas died and went to a devil's hell and is the greatest failure who ever lived. But Lot is one of the greatest failures of believers who ever lived. How did Lot end up in the condition he was? Now I want you to think about this tonight. We have Jerusalem that needs the gospel. And we're commissioned from God to go into all the world beginning in our Jerusalem. The world has come to our Jerusalem. God has brought these people to us living in the shadows of our church. Young people from 149 nations, by the way, they learn English as soon as they get here and do not want to be part of a language church. They want to be part of the English church group of people, but their families still speak the language they did. And those young people can win their families to Christ. If there's one thing we learn through the bus ministry and the Sunday schools that we have, we have learned this, children can bring their family to Jesus. Children can be a witness in their home. We've learned that. But the problem we have in our Jerusalem work is that Christians don't think like they used to think. They think like Lot. Now, not all of them, but I'll give you a couple of things. First of all, Lot allowed his heart to be captured with things. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 13 that God blessed Lot. Lot was a rich man but he loved what he had more than he loved the God that gave it to him. Lot loved what he had so much that he moved his family just to keep what he had. You know, Christians today don't think like they did when I got saved. Now, I'm not talking about the members of this great church. Christians don't think like that. I was sharing with some of the millenniums and I love, by the way, I love millenniums. I love the generation, uh, Z generation, I really. And people who study generations, who actually study generations for business say this, the Z generation has more potential than any generation. Can you imagine that? They believe the the Z, the young people, that's the, that's the generation that can literally change the world. Boy, if we could just believe that. That generation that pulled off the football game, that generation that, that we see the kids that are in school today, that's the generation. But I was speaking to some millenniums and I said, the difference in your generation and my generation, when my generation came into some money, we put it in the work of the Lord. We, we put it in missions. We put it in this. We did this. We didn't have people bombarding us with buy gold, buy gold, buy gold, be retired, do all of this. We believe the work of God deserved our heart and everything we could get our hands on. But people don't think like that today. They don't think like that today. There are not many people that are talking about buying the gold that Jesus says in Revelation. Buy of me gold. By the way, you ought to put the gold in heaven as part of your portfolio if you really want the blessing of God in your life. But Lot got captured by the things that he loved. And we know the Bible says that love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, not only does he not love God, but what God loves is not in him. That's the power of riches. And we're warned in the word of God that 
the love of money is the root, not a root, but the root of all evil. But yet we live in a day where so many Christians, so many Christians will do anything and everything just to keep what they have. We started Gulf Coast Baptist Church and God blessed, and I'll tell you, the only way you're ever gonna do anything for God, it's gonna take giving and a real sacrifice from God's people to get anything going. Do you believe that tonight? The second thing that Lot did, he developed a problem with leadership. His herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen had a problem. Now you would think that Lot would have understood that everything in his life all the blessings of God in Lot's life was a result of his relationship with Abraham. Every blessing of God in his life was because of his relationship with Abraham. By the way, did you get in on the blessing of Abraham? Amen. But he allowed a problem. We live in a day where People leave churches over anything. And I mean, a little problem, they're gone. And you think, what in the world's wrong with people? Families have problems. My brother and I have two sisters and, and uh, we have aunts and uncles and, and cousins. And I'll tell you, we can't hardly number all of them. And I remember the first time I brought my wife to one of our family reunions, the Gibson family reunion, not the Sexton family reunion. And I told my wife, now, we may have some odd things happen at this reunion, and it did. And she got in the car and we went back. She said, your family's, you got some crazy people. I said, that's families. My brother and I lead the, lead the, lead the gang in crazy people. But you know, churches have all kinds of people. Of course you're gonna have problems. Of course, you're gonna have difficulties. But you shouldn't pack up and move just because you got a problem. There's so many people that have left the place where God has blessed their life. I tell people, tie yourself to Gulf Coast Baptist Church. Don't you dare let the devil get you to leave this place. And I, I, listen, I know there's times when God takes a person to another level. They go prepare for something that God has for them. But look, stay, work it out. Get the blessing of God. I heard Dr. J.R. Faulkner tell me when I joined the staff of Highland Park Baptist Church, he said this to me, every blessing of God in my life, every good thing that's happened to me is the result of my relationship with Dr. Robertson, my pastor. Every good thing. And when Dr. Robertson was buried at his funeral, Dr. Faulkner stood by, by his casket, couldn't speak anymore, but someone read a statement he had written and he said this, every blessing of God in my life is a result of my relationship with my pastor. Now listen, friend. God said to Abraham, I will bless thee and I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. Genesis, read it. Lot developed a problem with spiritual leadership. Number three, Lot moved his family. As I mentioned, how in the world? He moved his family. Let me give you another one. Number four, Lot accepted the person of the wicked. Now he knew what Sodom and Gomorrah was. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He leaned towards Sodom and eventually he moved in it. But here's a great verse, you ought to write it down. Here's a verse to meditate on. Matter of fact, this verse explains what's happened to our nation in Washington and what's happened to our churches, this verse. Proverbs 18, five. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow righteousness in judgment. 
It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow righteousness and judgment. I can remember a few presidents ago when some things happened in the Oval Office that were unspeakable things. And they just said, okay. Now let me tell you something. That changed America. Every time we accept the wicked, we lose something. We used to hear, you don't get what you expect, you only get what you inspect. But that's not true. You should write this. We become what we accept. We become it. Somebody's got to clear off a spot and say, we will not accept less than what God wants. Amen. You know what Lot did? Lot could not handle the wealth. He loved it more than he loved God. Lot allowed a problem to come between him and Abraham. And Lot accepted the people of Sodom. He accepted them. We don't have to talk about where we are in churches across America. We know what's going on in churches across America. We know what's going on. It's hard for us to imagine. It's hard for us to believe. But it's happening. Now look, our problem is not what's going on in the White House. Our problem is what's going on in God's house because it's in God's house that we've got a plan to reach our Jerusalems. Are you still with me tonight? See, we're living in a day with lot-minded believers trying to reach a Gomorrah-minded world. And what a challenge. Another thing that Lot did, when God got him out of Sodom, and God did, when he was captured and taken out, he didn't stay out. He went right back in it. How many times have we seen Christians you know, they hit the altar and pray, oh God, deliver me from this and deliver me from that. And God does deliver them. He promises he will show us a way out. And then yet they go right back in it. They should never make provisions for the flesh, but they go right back in it over and over and over again. Then Lot tried to change Sodom. He tried to change it with a political office. Come in to be judge. One of the things that stirs my heart is what the Lord Jesus did when he called Simon the Zealot. He proved through Simon the Zealot's life that the gospel can do what a political movement cannot. Now I want to tell you, I'm for helping people the right people get in, the, get in the place of office, but we've got to be more concerned what's going on in our Jerusalem reaching people with the gospel. Amen. Amen. I, I remember when we had the moral majority, and I remember bus captains and Sunday school teachers spending their Saturdays enrolling people to vote so we could change America, and they never came back to their bus route and their Sunday school. If we're not careful, it's gonna happen again because that's the way Lot thought. Well, I can make a difference. I'm a man of influence. I'll make a difference in this place. But the greatest failure that Lot had, his greatest failure was he did not teach his children what he had been given from God. He didn't teach him. Do you know you have to work at getting a hold of this? God bless Brother Ab Thomas. <laughs> Our girls had the privilege of going to a great church and they were enrolled in Christian school all of their lives and they were part of the program that Brother Ab headed up. And I cannot tell you how many times at night, Brother Ab, we would go through these verses and help them memorize the verses so they could get their badges. And these little things, so they could do these things. 
And I'll tell you, that took some work. We had to do some things. We would drive in a car, they would go over their verses, they would say the books of the Bible, they would say the Bible verses, and little did I know, little did I know, that God was hiding his word in their heart so they could do something for God with their life. But today, we don't have those kind of ministries in our Jerusalem works. We're not interested in memorizing and meditating on the word of God. And we're not interested in putting the word of God in our children's hearts. And one day, we'll realize our failure when our children are captured by this world. You see, Lot was a believer, but he loved money. He loved what God gave him more than he loved the God that gave it to him. He had a problem with his spiritual leadership. He would not, uh, would not resolve it. By the way, I think when Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, I think one of the things we need to remember, she should put her heels down and say, buddy, fix your problem with Abraham. We're not moving away from here. Amen. Amen. So I said all of that to say this. How are we gonna take this generation of Christians and reach the world that God has brought to us? How are we gonna do it? I'll give you some things real quick. Write them down. Number one, nail down your salvation. Make sure that you know God. If there's ever a day when you need to have a no-so salvation, it is today. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and, that's an important word, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, if you know that you know God, then you can believe on God to do something with your life. Remove those doubts. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, he that doubteth is damned if he eateth. Doubt will destroy you, destroy anything you ever wanna do. You'll never launch out, you'll never do anything until you remove doubt. But once you remove doubt and you get it settled and you know that you know God, then you can believe to believe. And if you can believe, you'll see all things happen. Number two, give our life to God's will. Now, what is God's will? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is the will of God for every single person to be saved. That's God's will. Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. People say, well, hold on a second. I wanna know what God's will for my life is. What God's will for your life is only after you figure out what God's will is. God's will is that every single person be saved. That is God's will. I mean, I can't believe the people that I meet who claim to be what we are, who believe in limited atonement, who believe that people got left out when Jesus died on the cross. Can you imagine the Bible says in the word of God, he made him to be sin for us. That's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians, the gospel, Christ died for our sins. Say that, would you? Christ Say it again, would you? Those are the five most powerful words a human being can ever say. Now the devil will do everything he can to hide that, that truth. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 
4, verse number 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid in whom, whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins and he was buried and on the third day he rose from the grave. Oh my goodness, the world is waiting to hear that. Our Jerusalem is waiting to hear that. Nail down your salvation. Give your life to God's will. That means if you meet someone and you've given your life to God's will, that means if that person needs God, you're gonna tell them how to be saved if you've given your life to God's will. Now watch. What would happen tonight if the people in this meeting would do one thing? From this night forward, I'm giving my life to help every single person do the will of God with their life. Now think about it. I'm giving my life to help you do the will of God with your life. I'm giving my life to help you do the will of God with your life. My life for yours. That's, that's how we got here. That's how these great churches came into existence. People gave their life to help people do the will of God with their life. That's what it's about. It's all about God's will. And once you give your life to do God's will, then every person you meet, you can help them do the will of God with their life. And let me tell you something. There is nothing that will bring you more joy than helping people do what God has given them to do. Wow. I remember the first time I sat in a village and I talked to a village pastor and he was very intimidated. Americans were there and I said, no, no, no. We're here. I'm here to help you. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I said, I came here for one thing. I just want to know, what has God put in your heart to do? Now, I could tell him a hundred things he could do, but I wanted to know what God put in his heart to do. And what he said to me was life-changing. He said, I want to reach my family. I want to reach this village. I want to reach this nation. That's what God's put in my heart to do. And I said, I've come to help you do that. There's nothing you can do that will bring more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you want to have a good day that day? Do you want to have a good day? Amen. I want to have a good day that day. Now, Jesus said, you, you, you think about these, one of these, you love these days, you like to have one, but the day of all days is when we stand before God. Every man shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. That day is the day you really want to be a good day. How can that be? Give your life to doing God's will. That would change the world. That would change this Jerusalem. That one thing. And I'll give you one more. What can we do? Nail down our salvation. Give our life to do God's will. And number three, see your calling. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, for you see your calling, brethren. See your calling. I like to help people see, to see it. Now I believe, when I say that, I want you to understand, this is what I believe. I believe if you'll obey a command, you'll see your calling. If you'll get busy serving God, God will show you where you fit in this. If you get busy serving God, God will show you his will. He will show you his calling. The will of God is something he will anoint you with. It will find you. Just like David was watching the sheep doing what he was supposed to do and he was anointed king. God will show you 
his plan and purpose for your life. You will see your calling if you will obey his command. But you can't reverse it. You can't say, Lord, if you call me to preach, I'll do this. No, 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 that's not the way it works. You say, Lord, I'm gonna do what you say. I'm going after people. I'm gonna tell them how to be saved. I'm gonna see them baptized and I'm gonna teach them all things. Oh, there's so much I'd like to say that, but I, I have to stop. You know, the woman at the well, she came to Jesus and that woman fascinates me because I think I've seen her scores of times. Married five times, lost all that beauty and just living with someone. She comes to the well and Jesus is sitting there. And you know the story. He asked her for a drink. She said, why does a Jew have anything to do with us? And he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is, now think about that. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that speaketh to thee, you would ask. And I'd give you living water. And then she goes on, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us his parcel of ground? Then she said this, and it stirs me. We know, we know, our village knows, we know that Messiah is coming. We know that all of these centuries we've been holding on to he's coming and Jesus said, he that speaketh to thee. Is he? <laughs> Can you imagine? Waiting on Jesus. And she said, we believe. The one thing we're holding on to, we're Samaritans, we're despised by the, by the Jews, but we know this, God has promised one day, Jesus is coming. And he says, I'm here. Amen. Do you know all over this world and all over our Jerusalem, People know, they know Jesus has come. And she said, and when he comes, he'll teach us all things. He'll tell us everything. Right outside these doors, God has brought the world to this city. You don't have to get on a plane to go find them. All you have to do is go down the highways and hedges. They know where they are. The public school system knows where every one of them are. And we can reach them. They want to know what does Jesus have to say to me? Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses. What a wonderful, wonderful thing God has given us. We must reach our Jerusalem. Let's bow our heads in just a moment. We're gonna pray. With our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, I wanna ask you for the Lord. If you're here tonight and you say, I'm not saved, please, please, don't live another day with doubt. Don't live another day. Don't let the devil rob you of another moment of your life. Come tonight, let someone take a Bible and show you how you can know that you know him. Get it settled, nail it down. And then begin to believe, believe. Tonight, if you're here and you say, I know the world has come to our Jerusalem. Now we got 149 different nations, 156 languages. We couldn't start a language church for every one of them if we wanted to. They're gonna have to come to Gulf Coast. I'll tell you tonight, what we need is some people to say, you know, I'm gonna be an old fashioned Christian. I'm gonna be a first century Christian. I'm not gonna let what this world has and what I have keep me from God. I'm not gonna have a problem with my spiritual leadership. I'm not gonna move my family. 
I'm not gonna accept the person of the wicked. I'm not gonna let my children die without knowing God. I'm gonna make a difference in lives. Best thing you can do, find a place on this altar and say, oh God, help me. But maybe tonight you'd say, Brother Tom, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned Christian. I understand what it means to be lot-minded, but I'm not a lot-minded believer. I'm an old-fashioned Christian. God bless you. Then give your life fresh and new again. Find a place on the altar and say, Lord, tonight, help me to see our Jerusalem. I believe with all of my heart, until we get it in our heart, we'll never be able to reach it with the gospel. Lift up your eyes and look on the field. They're white unto harvest. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Father, help us tonight as we give this invitation. May your blessed will be done.